Good morning. Welcome to Atlanta First United Methodist Church. My name is Hangun Kim, and I am an intern pastor, um, intercon ed student for this fourth semester. So I'm here to meet you at this worship. I have two announcements. The first thing is we're celebrating 175 years this four as the oldest Protestant church in the city of Atlanta. So join us for our 175 kickoff festivities um, around the theme for in Faith, Sunday, August 28th. Worship begins at um, 10 a.m. like today and with guest preacher and son of Atlanta, Reverend Dr. Gregory Allison. There will be um, food, games, and a community partners fair um, at um, um, two, uh, 12 p.m. So please, um, please visit our website and please RSVP uh, for, the, for the festival. The second thing is um, there are many opportunities to grow together in Christian fellowship this fall. Please visit our website as well. And um, for details and links to class registration in the website. So now, now we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand, of the God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge and quick in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we sing the praise
You may be seated. I'll add my welcome to Sun Yuns. I am Jay Burnsport, and I serve as the Director of Community Engagement here at Atlanta First. And whether you are worshiping with us online or in the sanctuary, we are delighted you chose to worship the living God this day at Atlanta First United Methodist Church. Amen, yes. Atlanta First exists to worship God, to serve people, to grow together, and to engage the city of Atlanta and beyond. And there are a number of ways that we do this, and I encourage you to read your bulletin, to read your worship guide, um, download it if you're watching us online, and see about the ways that you can get involved in the life of this church. Also, we just released our messenger, and we'll be mailing that out as well, which has pages and pages and pages of things that you can get involved in all the way through October. So check that out. And if you're in the sanctuary, you can pick those up at the doors as well. We're now entering the time in our service where we go to God in prayer. Before that, I wanted to just acknowledge that a special note that the altar flowers, these beautiful flower arrangements, were given in honor of uh, Dr. Bob, by Dr. Bob and Miss Flo, who ha cannot make it today, but are celebrating their 69th wedding anniversary. And so we give thanks for that as well, yes. And then a group yesterday, we went out here and cleaned up the garden next door and planted some new flowers as well. So I want to acknowledge that in the potters outside the front of the church when you walked in. So we give thanks for everybody who helped with that as well, the Collies and Cornelia. Let us go to God in prayer now. God, you formed the mountains. You created the winds. You grew life into us. And yet, you still have time to journey beside us on this journey of life. To you, O oh most holy God, we give thanks. Thanks for walking with us in the garden, for leading us out of Egypt, for guiding us as we wander in the deserts of life. Thank you for walking with us even to the cross, to the grave, and then to the sky. You never leave or forsake us. It is a comfort even in our darkest days that you are beside us, O oh God. O oh God, we know you are beside Ted Jennifer and his family on the loss of his father-in-law, the Reverend Dr. Walter McKevney a servant for your kingdom and a pastor in the United Methodist Church for many years. We know you are beside Bill Sims and his mother on the loss of his sister this past week, Gwendolyn Tigner. You are beside all those mourning, all those grieving, you're beside Miss Virginia Howard and her family this day as she prepares for the kingdom triumphant. What a glorious life you have led her on, O oh God. You walk with Dr. Bob and Miss Flo as they journey out of the hospital and into nursing care. May you continue to grant them your healing. Walk with Les Scarborough and Dallas Terrell and Danny Pierce on their journeys of healing as well. And all those on this prayer list, all those struggling with COVID and monkeypox, help us to get our vaccines and to protect those we love, most holy God. You walk with our friends at the front door, and our friends on the margins, 
we have read your scriptures, God, and know that this is some of the favorite steps you take are with our siblings on the margins. Help us care for them as they seek stability in life, God. You are with Dorothy and Turnipseed as home repairs are underway and with all those who continue to suffer from natural disasters. Oh God, we ask for prayers as we continue to steward your creation. Ask us to be gentle, to take only what we need. We know we have fallen short in this way. Return us to right relationships with you, your creation, and each other. Walk with our children, God, as they enter another year of schooling. Grant them courage and wisdom and perseverance to learn even when it is difficult, O oh God. Walk with our educators and our educational staff as they support your little ones. Safeguard them from violence and grant them peace. Peace, O oh God, is the walk we seek to be on with you. One where we no longer have to mourn the losses from mass shootings and senseless violence. One where we no longer have to pray for an end of war because war is no more. One where we walk is more like a skip, a jump, a celebration of joy. Help us run with joy this day, O oh God. Joy in celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Another year older for Aaron Moody and Clarence Tillett and Betty Ann Tolbert. Joy for another year together with Dr. Bob and Miss Flo as they celebrate love. Joy for Ted Jennifer's daughter, Victoria, and her medical school entrance. Joy for rest and Sabbath for our pastor. Joy for wings on our affordable housing development. Joy for new flowers out front and time and fellowship. Joy for 175 years as a church in community with you. Oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Continue to walk with us, O oh God, as leaders in your kingdom, marching forward in faith, forward in love, and forward in hope. Let us learn to pray as your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. I now want to take a moment and talk to our kids for a second. So if you are a kid and you are watching online, why don't you scoot closer to your camera? We're going to chat for a little bit. So I've got, I've got a couple balloons actually down here. What do you like to do with balloons? Kids in the room, what do you like to do with balloons? Blow them up. You like to blow them up. We like to use them for celebration, right? We used to decorate at parties and events. 
Wa water fights? <laughs> Amber's over here very enthusiastically saying water fights. <laughs> but balloons, we, we do, we like to blow them up, but sometimes we can act a lot like balloons. Um, we get a little puffed up, so to speak, you know? We get a little puffed up. And we like to think that everything is about us. And so we sometimes think we're the smartest. We think we're the best in math class, right? We think we're the best at football or baseball. We think we're the best at clarinet. <laughs> we think we're the best singer in the room. The best at our job. And then we get to the point where we're all puffed up about ourselves, that we have no really room to have any other thoughts in here. Or better yet, somebody comes along and challenges our beliefs. And we burst. I feel like we see a lot of bursting in our society lately. People who think they are better than others, that they just explode when confronted about it. This crosses all lines, all people of all races, ages, political ideologies, everyone. However, Jesus teaches us to not get so puffed up, right? Jesus teaches us to be humble. And that's what we're talking about today. The last of our series is to walk humbly. He actually says we need to remember to be like you all watching online. We need to be like kids curious about life. Back in a time when we didn't get all puffed up about ourselves and simply asked a whole lot of questions and tried to learn about the diversity of creation. I think this week, that's the challenge for us, right? To try to not get so puffed up. Do you think we can try that this week together? Everybody in the room, we think we can try that this week to remember that, give some other people some air in the room. <laughs> Sound like a plan? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, help us to be humble this week. Lead us in childlike wonder and help us to remember the world does not revolve around us and that true greatness comes in humility, childlike wonder, and faith. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us continue to worship in song.
Today's scripture is Micah chapter 6, verse from 6 to 9. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with ear or calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord calls out to the city. Wisdom appears when one fears your name. Hear, tribe, and who appointed her. We've now come to our time in our worship where we give back to God a portion of what God has so generously given to us. You'll still see there are a number of cards on the altar rail from our friends at the Front Door Mission. And we have a, a health service day coming up in partnership with Lazarus Ministries and North Avenue Presbyterian where we provide resources to, and health care to our friends at the Front Door. This is why we give, friends. We give so that these things can continue to happen. So that people have what they need. They have the love and the life that they deserve. I encourage you after the service to come up or as you pray to come up and take one of these cards and pray with it until our next friends at the front door. I also encourage you to give to these ministries to give back a portion of what God has given. The ways you can do that are listed on your screen. You can give online via atlantafirstumc.org forward slash give. You can give via cash app, text to give. Donating stocks or bonds, you can email the finance officer. If you're in the sanctuary, there's blue baskets at the doors. I invite you to give and give generously this day. We're all a part of God's 
anywhere without the Almighty God, would we? Yes. I pray for you. Yes. You pray for me. Words from my mouth. Words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive.
really is a message in and of itself for this day. Yes. That is not about us. Right, right. It's about God. Ooh. That's the crux of the message today. I mean, I could skip this whole sermon. Walk humbly. It's not about us. It's about God. This week is part three of our Seriously series, considering how we respond in faith to a world that confounds us, confuses us, makes us angry and upset and sad and, and generally just makes us throw our hands up and go like, really? Seriously? I've mentioned the last two weeks that every day may seem like a new challenge and like the bleeding is leading in most news cycles. But this human discord is not new to now. Humans have rebe been rebelling against one another for centuries and centuries. And our faithful God, oh, our faithful God, has been sending servants to call us back to God for centuries as well. Call them prophets. Servants like prophet Micah, who reminded the Israelites when violence and disaster loomed large in their lives that it does not have to be this way. Destruction and devastation Hatred are, nev are not inevitable realities. There is a way to turn the tide of time. All we have to do is remember to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. To understand the prophet's words specifically, we've broken them apart and we looked at each of the components in more detail alongside the words of Jesus, who said he came to fulfill the words of the prophets. The first Sunday in August, we considered justice. And we talked about how justice is not our understanding of justice but God's understanding of justice. And it's about an ongoing struggle in community for liberation of all. That's the way we see abundant life. And then last week we considered loving kindness and mercy, hesed and agape. Remember those words, these ideals that are, are more than just words, more than just how we use them, but about deep relationships with people. Loving kindness is about loyalty and is evidenced by fruit, by changed lives it produces. It is an invested love that remains and endures. And this week we're talking about the last call, the call to humility, probably one of the hardest this day and yet the most vital. And we're going to examine humility through one of Jesus' teachings in the Gospel according to Matthew. We're going to begin in the 18th chapter, starting with the first verse. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the word of God for us, the beautiful and beloved people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are indeed our holy and our worthy God. 
hide this your servant behind that cross so that everything that is said and everything that is heard comes straight from you this day. Our rock and our redeemer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The greatest in the kingdom of God is humble like a child. Humble like a child. Have you hung out with any children lately? Young children especially? <laughs> the school teachers back here. <laughs> yeah. Last weekend, Jeremy and I attended our niece's third birthday party. It was held at a gymnastics facility in Woodstock, and there was probably 25 little ones, all under the age of five, descended onto this facility. Most of them had not seen anything like it, you know, with balance beams and trampolines and foam pits. So when they ran around to each of the pieces of equipment, they were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and their curiosity was in full force. They would ask somebody what this is, and you'd tell them, and then they'd go and they'd proceed to try it out for themselves. No inhibitions. Jumping on trampolines and swinging on ropes into foam pits, running and tumbling all the way. Better yet, when there was someone else, a certain other kid on a certain station, they'd stop and say hi to each other. You know, just pause for a second. Say something like, hi, my name is Lillian. What's your name? And then they immediately start bouncing on the trampoline together like they had been friends for years and years. The biggest smiles on their faces. It didn't matter that they were just moments before they did not know each other. They were there to have fun and explore, and nothing was going to get in the way of that. Jesus, in the Gospel lesson, places a child among the disciples. I love this note. People don't notice this all the time. He called a child whom he had put among them <laughs> for a purpose. And he says to them, be like this child. Be humble like this child. Jesus is speaking and living in a very Jewish community, a community who knew a lot of the other scriptures. They were a community living under Roman occupation of Palestine and were in many ways feeling oppressed. They wanted a savior, a messiah, a king, victorious, riding a white stallion to come and save them. They wanted the Messiah that the psalmist spoke of in Psalm 2 when he said, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. I shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like the potter's vessel. They wanted a Messiah like the prophet Daniel spoke of, where troops of the prince of God come to destroy the city. It shall come with a flood, and it shall end in war. Desolations are decreed. Yet in this part of Matthew, Jesus is correcting the record, so to speak. He's saying, I think there's been a misunderstanding God has said, not sent that kind of Messiah, that Messiah you want. He sent more of a suffering servant, like the prophet Isaiah prophesied. Isaiah says, for he grew up before you like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with affirmity. Yet through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish all shall see, all shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The will of the Lord, Jesus says, is not coming in expected 
ways. The kingdom of God is topsy-turvy. And you need to learn not from the oldest among you, but from the little ones. From the little ones, you need to be humble. I love the way the great African-American theologian, the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings, describes humility. He says, humility is to be a learner, to be curious. I don't know how any more curious you could get than a young child in that why phase of life. You know the phase where they start asking questions about anything and everything. Why do the birds chirp and the dogs bark? Why is the sky blue? Why don't dinosaurs, or that niece that I mentioned before, as she likes to call them, sores? Why don't the sores no longer exist? Why is the person lying on the ground outside that building? Why does Johnny speak differently than me? Why do people get sick? Why do grown-ups cry sometimes? There is this desire to grow in young children. They're rapidly developing the connections in their brain to make sense of the world, and unlike adults, they are free of much of the judgment many of us have carried from years of life experiences. We think we know all the answers to the whys, and so we stop asking the questions. We stop trying to develop the new pathways. It's like we've built a puzzle and then we've glued it down, right? We've made the pieces work and we, we don't want to pick them up again to re-examine them for fear that we may have misplaced a few or there could be another way to put the puzzle together all together. Humility is about being inquisitive. Our society today is full of fundamentalists, <laughs> on the right and on the left, the religious and the not-so-religious. We're entrenched in our beliefs that we have no desire to learn anymore, to learn other ways of being. We like to assume that we are right and that our way is the only way. We make judgments about other people and their beliefs. We've stopped asking why they believe what they believe or why they think that's the best step forward for this organization, this church, this government, this culture. Frankly, <laughs> we often assume their naivete or their stupidity before examining our own biases and our prejudices. We'd rather avoid the hard conversations and awkward encounters than be transformed by them. I think it's so sad that adults don't walk around like little kids and asking other people their names and say, I want to be your friend. <laughs> In fact, if a stranger walked up to you on the street later today and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, can we be friends? Most of us would be like, You've lost it a little bit. Instead, we sit in the waiting rooms and the lobbies and on the MARTA trains and buses, and we don't speak to one another. We put in our headphones. Yet the best pastors and leaders, Mr. Bill, I know adopted a childlike spirit of concern for others. They're curious. They frequently walk up to strangers and ask about their lives. I attended a celebration of life for a childhood mentor of mine in Rome, Georgia, this past Friday, Miss Jane Fleming. I will never forget, she always stood, never missed a Sunday, by the elevator of the Wilder Center. And she'd introduce herself to every person who walked in those doors. Hi, I'm Jane. What's your name? If they had kids, she'd ask them if they wanted guidance to the nursery. If they had youth, she would direct them to the youth room. If they looked like they showed up by themselves, she'd ask, do you want to sit next to me? Or do you want to come to Sunday school with me? Jane had this childlike spirit 
that free her up to find joy in anyone's company. Christians who know this childlike faith are interested in others. They show up in unexpected places and they don't assume to have all the answers, but instead preach from their questions. I'll never forget the first time I met the Bishop Karen Olivedo. She's the resident bishop now of the Mountain Sky Episcopal area of the United Methodist Church. It was well before she became a public figure as she is today, before she was even bishop. We were sitting in a comp committee meet room at General Conference in Portland, Oregon in 2016, and one of her co-committee members was irate that they were letting gays into the church and that they were wanting to marry and get ordained and fulfill a call, and she was venting all of this directly to Karen. She eventually paused as if she wanted Karen to respond with something. You could tell this woman was keenly aware, unaware that Karen herself was a married lesbian pastor of the, um, one of the large, denomination's largest churches, Glide Memorial in San Francisco, the only female senior pastor of a top 100 church at that time. And Karen could have easily gotten angry and defensive. Yet what she did next I will never forget. She asked calmly as a counselor would, why do you feel that way? Where do these strong beliefs come from? Never once revealing anything about herself. She didn't make it about herself in that moment, but sought to learn more about the woman in front of her, the child of God in front of her. She knew, I think, the call of humility was one of keen interestedness in the other. Instead of a situation blowing up or turning in toward anger, it turned toward peace, toward understanding, toward a future together in hope. Never once did Karen compromise herself either. She did not make it herself less she just decentered herself. I think this is an important note about humility. Sometimes people think that humility. So, well, so sometimes people. How do I phrase this? Sometimes, especially people in places of power and privilege, they like to make humility a, a tactic of control. They equate it to submission or subordination. They use it as a tool of oppression, right? Be humble so that I might be great. Yet humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not putting yourself down or letting others put you down or saying you're less than others, not worthy, but rather thinking about yourself less. Not pretending the world revolves around Jay, around you and only you. In fact, humility requires a great deal of self-awareness and self-confidence. To know your worth does not come from others' perceptions of you and that you don't need to tell everybody how smart or wise or successful you are. Because God already knows that. To walk humbly is to be at peace with yourself and in your own skin. Last thing I want to say about humility is that humility requires great vulnerability. Jesus placed a child among the disciples and said, be like this kid. He didn't say be the biggest or the strongest or the fastest, but be this child because they have a lot of courage. Go back to that puzzle metaphor I used earlier for a second. 
It takes bravery to be able to say, I may not have this puzzle exactly laid out all correctly. To take a few pieces out and consider them again. And pulling one piece out might cause you to have to take a few more pieces out. And then your puzzle has some holes in it that need to be filled. Meeting new people can be scary. It can open us up to hurt. Asking questions can force us to wrestle with difficult realities. But as we do, we build those new heart muscles, new ways of being in relationship with one another. When we walk with this childlike humility, our frustrations become curiosities. Our inabilities become opportunities, and our anger becomes peace. We are more interested in the big picture, in God's picture, than our own picture. Jesus said, the greatest in the kingdom is not the one with the most degrees, the most prestige, the most wins under their belt or wards in their trophy case. No, it's the child, or the one with the childlike faith, who is inquisitive and caring, curious and vulnerable, the one who walks humbly with their God to the end of the age. This is the call and the message for us as followers of Christ this day. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. This is your opportunity. Atlanta First, we are a group of people from all different walks of life. I could look out in this sanctuary this morning and I could read those comments online and every person comes from all different stripes, all different walks of life, all different backgrounds and stories. And yet we've all found a place here seeking to know God better and to grow together in this place. If that is something, if God is pulling on your heart this day and you want to be a, a part of something bigger than yourself, be part of a community that nurtures and grows one another, I invite you into membership with Atlanta First United Methodist Church. You can send me an email at j at atlantafirstumc.org. We'd love to have you as part of this community of faith. Know that during this last song, the altar whale is open. We ask that you stay socially distanced somewhat, but you are invited to pray. To remember that God's got everything. Doesn't, you do not have to do everything. You can be curious. You can ask questions. Do that this week. That's the call. Embrace the childlike faith and wonder. Let the church say amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for this closing benediction. The church say
go now walking with God. Amen.